Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm interviewing Dr. Greg Hammer. He's a recently retired professor in the Stanford University School of Medicine, a pediatric intensive care physician, pediatric anesthesiologist, mindfulness expert, and the author of Gain Without Pain, the happiness handbook for healthcare professionals. Now, this podcast isn't just for healthcare professionals. In fact, we're going to be talking about the ins and outs of rewiring your brain and how your thoughts do impact how you feel. But not only that, we're going to talk a little bit about how certain practices, such as what Dr. Hammer talks about in his GAIN protocol or his GAIN method, it's gratitude, acceptance, intention, and non-judgment, and how you can use those four things to promote overall well-being and harmony between your mind and and body. While Dr. Hammer has established himself as a guiding light for numerous physicians facing burnout in their respective fields, he has a lot of information that is relevant to anyone out there who's facing burnout and feeling like they've got to figure something out. So let's introduce you to Dr. Greg Hammer. Dr. Greg Hammer, welcome to the Health Fix Podcast. Great to be with you, Janine. I'm excited to talk about resilience in the medical field and really the the concept of rewiring our brain when it comes to thoughts that happen in our personal and professional lives. But as a doc who who really did struggle for quite a few years with imposter syndrome and having a lot of crazy thoughts in my head, I'm really excited to to share your knowledge in in your book as well. So tell us what what got you thinking about hmm. Maybe, maybe some of us doctors need to rewire our brains a little bit, or maybe society in general needs to work on brain rewiring. What, what was the impetus behind that? I think, Janine, it was a culmination of many threads, as is common, I think, for most of us. How do we end up where we are exactly? I have been a longtime uh, student of Advaita or non-duality. Uh, a meditator. Uh, I, I go on spiritual retreat twice a year. And um, so I'm very interested in spiritual well-being, and I always have been. And of course, I've always been interested in physical well-being also, since uh, I'm a physician and have been for 35 or so years. And, uh, you know, I became a vegetarian when I was 18 and decided I better learn about nutrition. So you and I were talking about both being from the Chicago area and Wisconsin area. And so I'm from outside of Chicago, and I started my college career at at Northwestern, and I transferred to the University of 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 Wisconsin, rather, in uh, (laughs) mixing your location and my former location (laughs) together, but uh, went to Madison to study nutritional science, since that was one of the meccas. And I've always been very interested in nutritional science and physical fitness and mental and spiritual fitness. So... In 2011, there was a group convened at Stanford to address burnout among physicians, and that was called WellMD. So I joined that initiative, and uh, the idea was to really identify what the drivers of burnout are, and of course, that would point to the remedies. And uh, as time went on, I, I got to I got asked to give a talk at a uh, a national meeting, actually, of hospital administrators on burnout and wellness. So I did that, and then I got asked to give another talk and another talk, and then I had some sabbatical time and decided to write a book about it, which is called Gain Without Pain, the GAIN being an acronym for what I think really are the pillars of mental and therefore physical well-being as well, which are gratitude, acceptance, intention, and non-judgment. They form the acronym GAIN. So uh, that was kind of uh, synthesized because I needed acronyms. And, you know, as you know, in medicine and healthcare in general, we are loaded with acronyms. And uh, I think they do serve a purpose. We may overdo it at times, 
anybody that would come and join us on rounds in the pediatric intensive care unit at Stanford would probably not, unless they're uh, in healthcare, understand a word we said because it's all acronyms. We speak sentences and acronyms. So I thought, well, what are the fundamentals of, of wellness? And uh, three was not enough. Five was more than I could remember. So I, I came came up with four, gratitude, acceptance, intention, non-judgment, and gain. So it's been kind of a lifelong journey, I think, through the field of wellness, physical, mental, spiritual. And, uh, and here we are having this lovely conversation. <laughs> well, I'm sure glad that you did go through all of that. It's so funny that you dub is so hard for me. I get I get confused too between University of Wisconsin and University of Washington. Oh, it is so <laughs> tricky. We get we get speaking of acronyms, you stick into that 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 circle and boy the brain goes. Um in in that case and and I use that as an interesting segue because our brains become easily confused between what is threat and and what is not threat. And you know, when I started to dive into this this realm, especially when I was probably at my peak of burnout right as COVID started to hit, I really took a turn. And in my brain, I started to have a lot of different thoughts about how I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I didn't have enough training. I I took it very to heart that naturopathic medicine training is different than than conventional training. And I and I started to talk talk myself out of of wanting to be a doctor. And so I think you know, looking at the stats that you had on your website with with each year, 400 U.S. physicians commit suicide. I mean, this is this is a lot considering how many doctors there there are out there. And even that stat of 30 percent of new nursing graduates leave the profession within two years to add to that as an acupuncturist and naturopathic doctor after 10 years, more than 75 percent of our graduating classes are not even practicing as well. So this uh -huh. is crazy, it's crazy stuff, huh? Yes. Um, I think burnout is a, is a, is a real thing in healthcare. And, and of course, in every sector of life, because as you and I were discussing, our brains are wired for survival and not for happiness. And so we, uh, you also mentioned threat and not threat. I like that because one of my favorite topics is stress and the acute stress response, the physiology of stress, and why did we evolve these changes, these physiologic responses to, to actual threat called the acute stress response or the fight or flight response. That really evolved for a good reason. We were, you know, say go back 150,000 years, we're sitting in our cave trying to keep the fire going and keep our family warm and safe. And it behooved us to consider that there might be a saber-toothed tiger lurking outside the mouth of the cave. I mean, we were faced with lots of actual threats. And if we anticipated those, which meant we devote a lot of time thinking of the future and what might be the worst thing that could happen, which we now call catastrophizing, back then it was just planning. And yeah. so uh, it behooved us to be able to, at the drop of a hat, or at the drop of a saber-toothed tiger paw, uh, suddenly have an increase in adrenaline in our body, which causes our heart to pump a lot more blood to our muscles. The, the blood flow gets redirected to where it's needed for either running or, or staying and fighting. So there's a lot of adrenaline circulating in our body for a good reason. Uh, there's a lot of cortisol increasing in our bloodstream, which also increases our blood sugar, as does adrenaline which therefore combined with the increase in flow from the heart sends a lot of substrate, a lot of glucose to our muscles for optimal functioning. So we have all these responses to actual threat called the acute stress response or the fight or flight response. And they evolve for a reason, but now fast forward 150,000 years to now, this acute stress response is triggered mostly by our thoughts, right? I mean, for most of us, Unfortunately, not all of us, but for most of us, especially here in the United States, we're not faced with commonly faced with actual threats. We don't, there's not a lot of predation in our world, in our environment that involves us as the prey. 
And, uh, you know, we're not faced with, with a lot of uh, foes that want to fight us. So mostly uh, the acute stress response is triggered by thoughts of something stressful or an argument or, uh, you know, anxiety about a meeting with our boss. Uh, so this is something that we deal with all the time. And I think it's OK to have the acute stress response activated. The question is, how quickly can we neutralize those changes, the increase in adrenaline, cortisol, lots of other changes in our hormones, for example, before they become chronic? And uh, that's called resilience. I mean, I think that is as good a definition for me as re of resilience as there is. It's the ability to neutralize the acute stress response when it is no longer adaptive and to prevent those physiologic changes from becoming chronic. And when they do become chronic, we experience physical and mental fatigue, and that's what burnout is. Mm -hmm. So it's all about resilience in that case. Which is something that I really wish we could start teaching in, in preschool. And, you know, how how do we do it? I don't know, but I really wish this would start then because, you know, being being a doctor, there are certain stressors, right? But just being on this earth in general. And and like you said, different people have different thoughts. And, and it's almost like we we have no idea until we had no idea until the last couple of years when people started talking about this concept that a lot of what we think is not even true. You know, we're making stuff up in our head and then we create beliefs out of it. When you first learned that, did that blow your mind? Were, were you like, what the heck? Is this even possible? What, what was going through your head when you started to learn about all this stuff? I'm curious. Hey, Hell Junkies, wanted to tell you about my pal, Dr. Anna Marie Frank's supplement line that specifically targets the needs of women. From anxiety to depression to getting focused and balancing those hormones, as well as helping with sleep, she's got you covered. Plus, she has teas too. This day and age, it's hard to know what supplement companies are up to when it comes to sourcing and quality. That's why I love to get to know company owners. Dr. Anna Marie has created formulas that combine what I would do if I owned a supplement and tea company. So wanted to tell you about them. As a listener of the Health Fix podcast, you can get 10% off your order by using the code D-R-J-K-R-A-U-S-E when you head to happyholeyou.com. Now, say you're driving or out on an adventure and you're not gonna remember where to find this website. That's okay. My favorite products are all on my website at drjkrausnd.com. Just click on shop and you'll find everything I stand behind and use myself right there. So let's get back to the podcast. Again, I think it's been kind of a process, but yeah. yes, I, I realized through you know, study of the brain. And as an anesthesiologist and intensive care doctor, I deal with the brain a lot. Yeah. Um, certainly using drugs to manipulate what the brain is doing so that people who are having surgery are not awake and conscious, for example. And on the other hand, when the surgery is over, if appropriate, they regain consciousness in a relatively quick manner. Um, I think what's happening in the in the brain is so fascinating and there's all these neural connections. I'm also interested in the developing brain because a hot topic in pediatric anesthesia has been the effect of anesthetic drugs on the developing brain and what's happening with all these neural connections that are being formed during fetal life, uh, late embryonic and fetal life, all these little neuron the tips of these neurons are expanding and growing and reaching out to connect with other neurons and forming all of these, you know, many, many millions of connections. And the patterns of electric flow through these neurons become rather fixed and established. And uh, later in life, the more we think certain things, we're actually encouraging these connections to occur in these patterns. That's what thoughts are. It's really just a pattern of neural activity and uh, synapse formation and, and these circuits form. And the more we think those thoughts, the more embedded these circuits become. 
So really our thoughts beget our thoughts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talked about how our brains are wired. One way our brains are wired is to be rather negative. It's to think of the worst thing that can happen. But beyond that, just we have a negativity bias. We tend to remember negative thoughts and experiences and forget the positive ones. And so when you consider that our negative thoughts in the context of these neural connections becoming more well embedded, the more we think these thoughts, negativity begets negativity. So I'll give you an example. We wake up in the morning and we get out of bed and what's the first thing many of us think about? It's something that's not quite perfect with our body. Maybe we didn't sleep that well, so we start to think about that. Or, you know, maybe a part of our body is a little bit sore. So let's just say, you know, we our knee is, we strained the ligament in our knee or what have you. Or maybe we're just getting older and we're getting some osteoarthritis. Uh, cartilage is wearing out. So our knee's bothering us. We get up in the morning. We're thinking about our knee bothering us. And we get out of bed and we're sort of limping a little bit to the commode and we're thinking about why do I have this pain in my knee and I'm getting old and a whole series of these negative thoughts. And lo and behold, we start thinking those thoughts every morning when we get up. Mm -hmm. And so what's the remedy for that? Well, I always go to the GAIN acronym and the first word in the GAIN uh, series, if you will, is gratitude. So instead of thinking about that one thing that's bothering us in the morning, what if we actually got up and redirected our thoughts toward gratitude? So, you know, not to get overly, you know, medical and, and gross about it, but I think it's not gross. It's actually quite beautiful. We could wake up and be grateful. Wow. All night while I was asleep, my kidneys were filtering my blood. They were taking these toxins out of my bloodstream, cleaning my blood, putting that toxic material into solution, sending it down through these elegant little tubes that are contracting and squeezing the fluid down to our bladder. And our bladder was kind enough for the most part to store all that liquid with this toxic stuff in it without waking us up to be emptied every 30 minutes, most of us at least. We make it up once or twice, but not every 30 minutes. And then we can actually get up and and aim at the commode and sitting, standing, however, we can get rid of all that toxic stuff. And so it's a miracle. I mean, that is really a miracle. We can think of all kinds of physiologic things in our body, the way our heart is working, the way our brain and lungs are coordinating so that we're breathing when we're not conscious, so many things for which to be grateful that have been going on all night. So let's not focus on this one thing that's bothering us. Let's pick something positive, something miraculous. And I mean, let's face it, the human body is full of miracles. So this is a way of redirecting our thoughts. And so that we don't have all this pattern, these patterns of negativity starting right in the beginning of our day and carrying on. Let's redirect those thoughts to something beautiful, miraculous, and something for which we're grateful. Absolutely. I've never actually thought about the miracle of what our body does overnight when I woke up. I'm actually going to steal that because I do tend to, you know, think about positive things and, and do a lot of the grateful practice. And I think a lot of people do, but I don't know how many people have actually been to a training of gratefulness where they went, went into the body's miraculous function. So guys, we got a new one there. That That's good stuff. That's good. Stuff. And there's so many things, so many uh, organ systems, if you will, <laughs> to, to think about. Think about all the stuff that your brain is doing. Actually, most people don't aren't really aware of it. They think sleep is just a passive activity, but that's not true. Sleep is a very active activity. Your, your brain is <clears throat> just like your kidneys are cleaning your blood, if you will. Your brain is actually getting rid of a lot of junk in the cells in your brain. Um, a lot of aging uh, mitochondria, these proteins uh, that we've become a little bit familiar with in the news, uh, uh, tau protein, for example, uh, amyloid protein, these things that are uh, build up in excess in 
let's say football players that have repeated head injury and are associated with dementia. And they're also associated with uh, Alzheimer's dementia. And the brain is actually getting rid of these proteins while we're sleeping, but we have to be in deep sleep. So it's really important that we focus on our sleep hygiene. And, you know, certainly, uh, I don't know about you, but when I was in medical training and, and even in practice, uh, you know, sleep was something that we sort of relegated to the middle burner because, you know, we were on call and uh, this idea that, well, we'll sleep when we're dead kind of mentality uh, and resilience is being able to function without sleep. And that is such a misguided way to think. Um, you know, sleep is tremendously important. So we could focus on what's happening while we sleep. We can learn about it and be grateful and redirect our thoughts to that. Like, wow, I slept last night, even if it wasn't perfect. All these great things were happening while I was asleep. So, yes, we have so much for which to be grateful. And we could start thinking along those lines when we wake up in the morning. And, uh, you know, I've heard other people talk about this in different contexts, this idea that we have these thought patterns that begin with, you know, our first thoughts of the day, and then they just get more and more entrenched as we go along. And lo and behold, we're quite negative. And uh, I think this is one of the main targets of, of a practice, call it mindfulness practice or whatever you like, that is targeting reorientation of the way we think, rewiring of our brain. And uh, I think this is one of the most exciting things about healthcare in the broad sense and, uh, you know, really making ourselves healthier. I, you know, I can't. I can't probably even quantify and I'm sure sure you you have the same thought like of how many things could benefit from thinking positively because I feel like you said if we don't get the day started off on a a good you know what we will tend to go downwards unless of course we can pattern interrupt in the middle of the day is this where acceptance comes in in the four pillars can you pattern interrupt if if the gratitude didn't quite set things off or if someone skipped the gratitude can we intervene so that the day doesn't go all the way down um in negative spirals with with acceptance well ac absolutely the the gratitude acceptance intention non-judgment are so tightly interwoven it's almost like they really set each other off. Um, mm. So, you know, the, the idea is to get up in the morning, <clears throat> excuse me, open the blinds. This is a game practice. Okay. Do your morning hygiene thing. Uh, be grateful about your kidney and bladder function, among other things. But then just find a comfortable place to sit. Hopefully somewhere quiet in the house or outside if the weather is supportive. Uh, close our eyes and we we focus on the breath. So we focus on slow, deep, intentional breathing, maybe in through our nostrils to a count of three, pausing to a count of three, and then gradually letting the breath go to a count of four through the nose or mouth. And we settle into this slow, deliberate breathing. And this is actually doing something physiologic, which is activating our parasympathetic nervous system through the vagus nerve. And slowing our heart rate, reducing the amount of adrenaline and cortisol in our blood, lowering our blood pressure, our heart rate, our blood sugar. So we settle into this breathing for 20 or 30 seconds. And then we go through a self-guided tour of that for which we're grateful, that we find uncomfortable or painful that we cannot change, and that's acceptance. Intention, we focus on our current experience and then maybe transition to what is our intention for the moment and for the day. And we finally transition to the end and gain, which is non-judgment. And we can talk about that if you'd like, but there's tools we can actually use to rewire our brain to drop judgment, which uh, is something that I think is so critical. And again, we're we're focused on the breath throughout this time. And then we simply return our focus to the breath before we slowly open our eyes. So you you asked about acceptance. Yeah. And, you know, as the serenity prayer would have us understand, uh, the world does not necessarily comport to our apparent wants and needs. And so we find ourselves 
in conflict with the world around us, other people, uh, various things happening in the world, um, and even ourselves. So we need to discern, or we're well served by discerning, what of these uncomfortable or even painful experiences we can change and what can we not change. So, you know, many of us lost people we knew and loved during COVID. Um, I lost my son at the age of 29, eight years ago. Uh, we've all lost loved ones. That's something that we can't change. And it's a source of pain and discomfort to us. So we have a choice. We can resist ever thinking about those things and magnify our suffering. Uh, the other thing we like besides acronyms in medicine and our formulas. So there's a formula in the in my first book, suffering equals pain times resistance. So the pain is there, the pain of loss. If we resist it, our suffering increases. Suffering equals pain times resistance. And acceptance can be considered the opposite of resistance. So through acceptance, we lower our resistance and we decrease our suffering. So again, we need to discern, is this something I can change? Well, if it's the loss of a loved one, the answer is clearly no. And so let me kind of sit with this. And during our gain meditation, while we're focused on our, our slow, deep breath, we also then picture this painful experience and we actually breathe it in, we actually bring it closer to our body, open our chest, open our heart, bring this experience into our heart and nurture it with our heart, actually sit with it, breathe with it, and relax our body as we do so. And we learn that we can actually live with this and we can accept this. And, and then we go on to the I and gain, which is intention. But this acceptance practice is very interconnected with the other elements of gain. So one reason we can accept things that are painful is because we have so much richness, so many wonderful things in our lives. So when we think about, you know, maybe we lost a loved one. For me, I had two children. I'm grateful for my daughter. You know, I have this beautiful 32 year old daughter that I spent half an hour on the phone with last night. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. And I'm so grateful for the other, other people in my life with whom I share love and friendship. And so this is, a, again, it's very interwoven with our ability to accept things that aren't perfect or are maybe even very painful in our lives. Uh, this is part of life. Life has its ups and downs. It's it's pain and it's joy. And the sooner we 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 actually adopt a practice to understand and accept that, the better. But again, the acceptance comes in part through gratitude, through our intention, and through our ability to drop the judgments, which magnify our suffering as well. That's quite thorough. When you when you think of it, you've covered all the aspects and different things that will come up, which is nice because it compacts things for folks so that the practice is easier to be able to carry out at least at least is how I see it. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about judgment a little bit because I do think that that is one of the biggest sticking points especially in a professional setting. We do tend to self-judge a lot, but also in anyone who's not, you know, uh say in a professional setting, it's easy to judge your body kind of like you were saying. We think about like why am I so creaky? You know, why can't I lose weight? You know, whatever it may be. So I'll let you kind of explain a little bit more on working on non-judgmental practices. Sure. Well, first, I think we have to distinguish between discerning and judging, right? So it's important to discern. So an example, I've got an hour uh, in the middle of the day to get together with a friend. I can either get together with Sam, who's kind of a, a downer. He's complaining a lot. He's very judgmental. He, tends to gossip about people that we know. Um, I don't feel that great at the end of an hour with Sam. Uh, although, you know, Sam is, I consider him like a brother. Or I could spend that hour with Jim, who's upbeat, pragmatic, present, uh, mindful. He's like, I would like to consider myself. And, you know, we have great conversations. We talk about spirituality. We talk about many things. So, I'm going to discern 
that I would rather spend my hour with Jim because, you know, it's a wonderful experience and, and, you know, I, I care about them both, but I don't have to judge either one of them. I don't have to judge that Sam is bad and Jim is good. There is no good and bad uh, about us, about people. We're not really, this is my view, not everybody will agree with this. We're not infused with the qualities of goodness or badness. We simply are the human that we are. And since our minds are wired to be judgmental and they're also wired to be negative, most of our judgments are negative. When we judge others and we judge the world around us, and as you suggested, most harshly for sure ourselves, we're negative in our judgments and we're, we're har very hard on others, the world, and mostly ourselves. So can we change this? You know, again, these judgments are simply, if you want to get... Uh, neurophysiologic about it, they are patterns of nerves firing and communicating with other nerves in different parts of our brain. And they become entrenched, these patterns, these judgments, uh, these neural connections uh, fortify one another every time we judge. So can we have a practice where we drop the judgment? And so in the game practice, We've been sitting now for three or four minutes, breathing deeply, going through gratitude, acceptance, intention. We get to non-judgment. So here's an example of what we might spend 45 seconds doing during our five-minute gain practice or three or four-minute gain practice when we get to the end and gain during this sort of self-guided uh, contemplation. We... Uh, as we breathe deeply through our nose and pause and, and let the breath go through our nose and mouth slowly, we picture an image of the earth apparently suspended in space, one of these beautiful NASA images of the earth. And it's a lovely planet. And it's also neither good nor bad. It's just a planet. It doesn't have the qualities of goodness or badness. It's just... A, a you know it's a beautiful orb there's a lot going on on the surface but the planet is neither good nor bad it's just a planet and then we transition to thinking of ourselves in the same way i am just the person that i am i am neither good nor bad i'm just a human being i'm neither good nor bad i just am the person that i am i simply am i am and this is connected to this slow, deep, deliberate breathing. And we sit with this idea for even just 15 seconds. And then we return our focus strictly to the breath. And, you know, we can picture a mountain, a tree, uh, you know, an image of ourselves ultimately. Uh, but we can teach ourselves and establish these neural patterns associated with letting go of judgment. Because judgment really is like a thin veil that we are looking through when we're exercising these thoughts. We're, we're not seeing things as they truly are. We're coloring them, if you will, with our own biases, right? Our own internal ways of thinking. So when I think about another person, you know, I judge them according to my own set of biases, and uh, if I drop those judgments, I just see them as a person. You know, there can be a bit of a positive cue to it, but really they're neither good nor bad. And I, and I feel that way even about people who clearly do harm to others. You can trace that back to their parenting. And then why was their parenting like that? It was because of their parents' parenting. And, you know, you can just sort of keep going back and back and trying to explain why somebody is the way they are, why I am the way I am. And ultimately, you may just find rest in the notion that I am just that I am. <laughs> that there doesn't have to be goodness or badness to it. And so, you know, this is a way of practicing non-judgment. And we do need to practice it because I think that our brains are wired to be judgmental. And, and with our negativity bias, we're often negative in our judgments. And, and the good news is, our brains have this wonderful quality called neuroplasticity, and we can actually change the way we think. 
And so that's what the game practice is really all about. It's inc it's an incredible concept, I think, still to this day for many of us who weren't kind of brought up in the realm that what you can change your brain like Norman Doidge, I believe, was the book, The Brain That Changed Itself or something like that. If I'm remembering the book correctly, um, that was my first foray into I'm reading this going, what? I can change my, you know, and you know, here we are. Did you read that one? Did you? Did no, you I haven't read that one. I've read some other books about, you know, changing your the way you think, um, changing your mind, etc. cetera. Um, and actually, you know, this, it has become a kind of a hot topic. So there are a number of books written about it. There's a lot online about how we can rewire our brains and change the way we think. And there's a lot of research going on with drugs and, and you know natural substances I and mean, you're a naturopath i don't know how you feel about uh natural substances that might help people change their minds psychedelic drugs um psilocybin being one there's a lot of very very legitimate research going on about how we can actually rather you know quickly change the way the brain is wired in in certain ways um, you know, with guided psychedelic experiences, for example. So it's just, you know, really, as you suggested, such a fascinating topic. It It is. And, and definitely with the psychedelics, I'm intrigued. You know, a lot of the plant medicines intriguing, a lot of even just anything that can help folks with the process. Because I think you see this as I'm going to rewire my brain oh my gosh, that's eight pounds of what is going on in there, you know? And depending on where someone's been in life, the different things they've been through, they might be thinking like, oh, I'm a hot mess. How am I going to do this? But, you know, looking at your book, it's a very simple, straightforward with the gain process. It's very easy to to understand, okay, if I do this, I can work on changing my my complete way of, of thought. Now, I'm curious because you're an anesthesiologist, and background of, of putting people to a nice, nice sleep while they have surgery or different procedures. Have you uncovered any research of any of the things that would be commonly used for anesthesiology that has been researched for helping with brain changing and brain rewiring? Anything in there? Well, you know, I don't know about changing the brain uh, during anesthesia while there's a surgical procedure going on, but, you know, certainly... <laughs> The drugs that are used, ketamine is one. I, I happen to have used a lot of ketamine in my career uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, it has some wonderful properties as an anesthetic. Um, and ketamine is one drug that's being used to treat people with addiction or PTSD or a number of other uh, conditions where rewiring of the brain is rather imperative. Um, so that would be an example of a of a drug that that does have anesthetic. It's, it has very important anesthetic properties that can be used uh, therapeutically in a different context to help uh, people with depression and and other mental disorders, psychological disorders. So, but I, I you know I just think that uh, anesthesiology is such a fascinating field for so many reasons, but one of them is just how these drugs affect the way that the brain is functioning. And somebody who's under anesthesia is not really asleep. If you look at their brainwave patterns, for example, they're they're not the same as what you see if you look at brainwave patterns in somebody who's naturally asleep, right? And, and the drugs that people take to help them sleep actually interfere with these normal uh, electrical processes and deprive the individual of some of the restorative benefits of of real sleep. So that's why these sleep, many of the sleep drugs, especially the ones that are not probably in your domain, uh, naturally occurring substances are really to be discouraged other than for very occasional use. Um, one exception might be melatonin, which, which does seem to support physiologic sleep. Um, and actually we produce less melatonin as we age. And that may well be one reason why People don't sleep as well when they get older. Um, I just wrote an article that I was asked to write on the summer blues. You know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of talk about the winter blues, but there's also the same kind of phenomenon that occurs 
much less frequently, but in people in the summer. And one reason that people may get sad in the summer, and there are several, uh, but one of those reasons might be related to melatonin because the long days, the long uh, periods of sunlight suppress melatonin secretion, uh, just as the opposite may happen in the winter. And, uh, you know, that melatonin is a really magical substance. It's not just related to sleep, but other physiologic important brain functions. So um, anyway, I'd be uh, interested in your perspective on natural, naturally occurring substances that, um, you know, may provide uh, not only sleep, but also perhaps the uh, setting for people to begin to rewire their brains uh, with the use of uh, naturetic substances. I don't know if you have any wisdom on that. <laughs> you know, I, I've tried a different, a, a lot of different things in the nootropic realm. So things from Bacopa, Maneri, to Huperzine A, to even going into some of the adaptogenic herbs to help rewire the brain. Even L-theanine in some combinations will help uh, along with um, ashwagandha, holy basil. It seems that what I've found, and, and this is only my own experiments in, in my own world uh, of patients, is that if I can calm the brain down enough we can and slow the brain down enough, we can get some change. Or if we can get enough focus we can get some change. And so those would be some of the most common ones. I'm laughing at myself about asking about ketamine. I'm like, of course, ketamine is one of the <laughs> anesthetics. <laughs> I got to go back and laugh at myself. But yes, ketamine, I, I mean, I do sign people for ketamine um, therapy as, as well. But back to natural substances I can work with. Yeah, L-theanine and holy basil tend to be a very good combination to help people, at least what I've seen in my world. Have you seen so there's interesting data on psilocybin taken in very small doses or micro dosing, you know, doses that are not associated with any psychic changes that the person experiences uh, as they would with a macro dose of psilocybin, but just taking very small doses. Um, you know, I look forward to more science on these things because right now, uh, you know, I've done some research on psilocybin and uh, just the literature research and it's all it's almost all anecdotal, uh, you know, for microdosing. What's the best way to do it? Well, you know, three times a week, blah, 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 or a week on, a week off. And and it's really just what people have experimented with themselves. Um, and then there's some survey science, if you will, where people who have microdosed are interviewed. But I, I think this is rewiring the brain, uh, you know, primarily through uh non-medicinal practice as we've been discussing yeah uh, but also i think there is there is a role for um you know naturally occurring ideally substances and and this is kind of a burgeoning area of research and i think it's just so fascinating well you know we were talking uh janine about uh books that have been written about rewiring our brains and i have read a few uh, i think michael pollan's book how to change your mind is my favorite Mm -hmm. And one thing I really like about it is it's very personal. So he describes his own personal journey and, uh, you know, he's a rather bold guy. He was open to trying a number of things. And so he describes that. So anyway, I, there is a lot written about rewiring our brain these days. And so I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. And I look forward to a lot of research coming out of academic institutions on, the use of psilocybin and other drugs and how they may facilitate and and expedite uh the rewiring process for the better. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely looking forward to that because right now the the situation in which when someone comes to me and wants to do that, we've got to find, you know, someone that's been trained, someone that's, you know, has been through some some level of of authenticity versus like there's this guy around the corner. He's got this good stuff, you know, <laughs> um, I swear it's going to change your mind. Um, it's it's funny, you know, I, I somewhat feel like a, a backdoor drug dealer when I'm I'm working on these kind of things. But the truth is, is that a lot of people really do have some pretty profound changes when they work with someone who can guide them and has a process. And I think that's what's really nice about your book. You know, if someone is going to because we can't really stop anybody doing their microdosing on their own, but if they're going to do it, at least get a book to work with. 
so that you got a baseline there process versus letting your brain try to figure out what it's going to do on its own because that doesn't usually end well, at least what I've seen with my patients. I think even people, um, if they're taking a naturopathic substance or what have you, when we do something that we believe is good for us, um, and we do things that we know are good for us, that gets us sort of begins to do this reorientation process, this rewiring process. So, you know, that's why I say when people have mild sadness in the winter or summer, uh, you know, it's called seasonal affective disorder. I think affective disorder implies something a little more serious and people who are having the inability to function should get professional help. But if it's just sort of mild depression, uh, mild anxiety, for example, uh, when we bring our focus back to the fundamentals of physical and mental well-being, and physical well-being, really the three fundamentals are sleep, exercise, and nutrition. So when we're experiencing these things, this depression, being a little bit off the rail, go back to the fundamentals of physical well-being. Focus on your sleep hygiene. You know, go to bed and get up at the same time every day if you can. Darken the room. Make the room cool if you can. Avoid screens proximate to the time of going to sleep. Caffeine has a very long half-life. That cup of coffee you have in the afternoon at one or two o'clock is like having half a cup at six or seven or eight o'clock in the evening. And that would keep me awake. So I stopped my afternoon cup of coffee. Um, you know, there's a number of fundamentals. And then, of course, exercise. You know, some is better than none. Go out and do a power walk around the block every hour or two while you're working at home, what have you. And then nutrition, you know, moving to a more plant based diet avoiding refined and sugary foods, et cetera. So I think when we start to do these things that are good for us, we are getting on track for doing more that's good for us. Again, this is part of rewiring the brain. It's our behaviors, not just our thoughts, but it's what we're doing with our bodies. You know, the exercise that we're doing, um, the focus on sleep hygiene. When we start to focus on good health, it's these neural connections related to thinking good thoughts begin to get entrenched and 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 predominant. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of doors that are open to us. Um, naturopathic medicine, for sure. Um, sleep, exercise, nutrition, a daily mindfulness practice. All these things will help us begin to get on a positive path and help us re wire the brain in, in the right way. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I think it's, it's definitely still keeping in mind that we need a comprehensive or holistic approach. It's not just that one magic bullet. Always want to highlight that we need, to, you know, to find a, a complete mix and definitely looking into your book, Gain Without Pain is definitely one of the places I'd like folks to to start if they're starting the process or even if they're going to continue the process. I think it's worth a look. So talk to Craig. Let's tell folks where they can find you online, get to know more about you and and dive a little bit more into you and, and your story. Well, they can go to my website, Greg Hammer, MD dot com g r e g h a m m e r m d dot com uh there's a lot of information there a lot of media and uh i'm in the process of really upgrading my website and social media just something that i have never really been very involved with uh but now that i'm retired from my medical practice uh, i have a little more time and and teaching is still uh extremely important to me so greghammermd.com is a good place to go Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. The social media eh. <laughs> teaching, <laughs> teaching is a better place to, to put your effort in terms of my personal opinion. Um, <laughs> but social media is entertaining. Let's, let's just say that. To, to well, say I think for me, it's just a matter of, you know, as I've been advised and come to realize just getting eyeballs to your website. And that's really where I'd like people to go. I'm hoping to offer as much uh, information there as I can. 
makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, great stuff. I really like the concept, the, the game concept, and, and I can see it being used really well for folks within a, a paradigm of rewiring, obviously, as the goal, but also as part of a holistic approach to help uplevel their life in general. So love the stuff. Dr. Greg, thank you for coming on and sharing all of your wisdom. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure, Janine. Loved, loved having a conversation with you. Hey, fellow health junkie. Thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.